count it a sincere privilege to have the opportunity to open God's Word and to share it with you. I'd like to invite you to find Acts chapter 1 and locate verses 17 through 19. Acts chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. As we continue our study in the book of Acts, we repeatedly interacted with the text on Judas that says this, For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the mist, and all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch as that field is called in their proper tongue, Alcidema, that is to say, the field of blood. One commentator commenting on these verses that I just read, he said it's one of the saddest profiles in all of Scripture. Now, that's what a man said about the life of Judas. But have you ever considered what God said about Judas? Perhaps in the margin of your Bible, it would be wise and appropriate to go ahead and put the cross-reference of Matthew 26, 24. Woe unto the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, it had been good for that man if he had not been born. I think in some senses it's one of the saddest verses in all of the Bible that Christ would say of Judas, it would be better if he had never been born. I want us to think about Judas today. I want us to think about who he is and what he did. And lest you think that this will be a very heavy message, stick with me because we're going to close with some real encouragement that I believe Judas and Christ's interaction with Judas brings to each of us. Now, the way we're going to study this is we're going to study it chronologically and try to pick up where Judas begins in the Gospels and make our way back to this text in Acts 1. So chronologically, let's see if we can identify where Judas is first mentioned. Take your Bibles, find Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10, we see a first mention. We find this in verse 2. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these. The first, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew his brother, James the son of Zebedee, and John his brother, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the publican, James the son of Alphaeus, and Labius, whose surname was Thaddeus. Here we go. Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. In this first mention, let's just kind of start at this fundamental place and talk about the name Judas. As I understand it, it means Jehovah will be praised. Now that kind of startles us a little bit because we don't think of Judas's life praising the Lord. But I do think there's a principle that helps us with this. You see, God will be praised. God will be glorified, either in our obedience or in the consequences of our disobedience. Even though Judas didn't live the life that truly pleased the Lord, the fact that Judas didn't get away with his sin, that there was a consequence to his life of sin, does help him live up to the name, Jehovah will be praised. And when you see the idea of Iscariot, we think, is that like his family given name? As in, my name is Perry, is his Iscariot. And I believe, more importantly, it is not a family name. It's really telling us where he is from. Some believe that it comes from this little city about 23 miles south of Jerusalem called Cariot, in which there is just kind of a rural town. And Judas Iscariot, is Judas from that town. Now the text also says that he is one of these many disciples. Now, when I read these verses, perhaps you noticed that they're all listed in pairs. And the reason they're all listed in pairs is because when Christ sent out his disciples, he sent them out two by two. So there in verse 4, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. When I was in ninth grade, I was in biology, and in biology they paired us up with other students, and we were at a lab desk with another student. My first semester was a really good semester because me, the D student, 
was assigned to be at a table with an A student. She was the smartest girl in our class. As I looked at first semester, I thought to myself, this is going to be a great first semester. I'm with somebody smart who's going to carry me through. Well, the second semester, I was given a new lab partner. His name was Bruce. And Bruce was a D student just like I was. There was no way we were going to have a successful semester. And when I read in Matthew 10, verse 4, Simon the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, my heart goes out to Simon the Canaanite, and I wonder if somewhere along the line he raised his hand and he said, could I have a new partner? Now I say that because we would suspect that along the way, Simon would discover Judas is a betrayer. Now, I've said it in the weeks past, and I still think it's true. I don't believe the disciples sensed that Judas was the betrayer. Now, with that said, before we address that, let, let's ask this question. Did at least Jesus know that he was a betrayer? And I think the answer to that one is an affirmative yes. Take your Bible and now look at John 6. John 6 and verse 68, we see the answer to this question. Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life, and we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. So in these verses, we do see an affirmative yes that Jesus knew him to be, in the future, a betrayer. It has caused others to kind of pause over these verses when the Lord calls him a devil. And questions surround, was he demon-possessed? How much satanic control did Satan have on Judas' life that caused him to do what he did? And I think perhaps a, a base point for us to start in that conversation is that when the Lord is referencing Judas as a devil, He's really associating with Judas the character of the devil, that the devil at his core is a liar and a deceiver. This isn't the one and only time that Jesus would use that term devil or Satan in referencing someone. Perhaps you remember when he turned to Peter and he said, Get thee behind me, Satan. He was attributing characteristics of Satan to Peter. I really believe he's characterizing Judas with some of the qualities of the devil that from the very beginning, Jesus knew that Judas was a liar and a deceiver, and that he would betray him. Now, Jesus isn't surprised by the betrayal of Judas, but again, we ask the question, are the disciples surprised that Judas is a betrayer? A couple of weeks ago, we looked at Acts chapter 1 and verse 17, where the Bible says this, He was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. So when Peter is talking about Judas, he says he was numbered with us. He was one of the twelve. And he also carried ministry responsibility. And one of the things I think he's referencing there is, we saw him just as one of us, not as an outsider, not as one who we would have pegged to be the betrayer. Now that text alone, Acts 1 and verse 17, does give justification that the disciples didn't see him as a betrayer. But I think there's one other text that reinforces this. It's found in John 13. So turn over with me to John 13 and find verse 21. John 13, verse 21, When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified. Now, time out, real, real quick, parentheses, let me give you a thought. Do you realize that it is said of Jesus that he was troubled? There is a wonderful study in the Gospels that I would encourage you and entice you to do at a future date. And that is to recognize in the Gospels the things that trouble a sovereign Lord. For you and I, the things that trouble us are the things that are outside of our control. For a sovereign who's in control of all things, what troubles him? And what you see here in John 13, verse 21, the thing that troubles him. 
the thing that grieves his heart, the thing that sits on him is the sin of mankind. It is the depravity of man that shows up in the way that we live. He goes on to say, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. Then the disciples looked one on another, doubting of whom he spake. Now there was, leaning on Jesus' bosom, one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. He then, lying on Jesus' breast, said unto him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, He it is to whom I shall give a sop. When I have dipped it, and when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. I would have loved to have seen this scene. Because the Lord says, One of you is going to betray me. And the uh, disciple John, he's got his head leaned up against the Lord. And Peter across the room, maybe with his eye, maybe with his chin, maybe with a hand gesture, he, he beckons to John. Hey, John, ask him who it is. And the reason I think this is important is because the disciples did not quickly come to the conclusion, ah, oh, he must be talking about Judas. Judas was not on their radar of a betrayer. Now, just because they did not know he was the betrayer doesn't mean there weren't telltale signs along the way saying something's off about Judas. He is not who he says that he is. You're in John 13. Let's go back one chapter. Go with me to John 12. And in John 12, verse 3, we see a text that introduces us to Judas, and for the first time, we hear Judas talk. It says, Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for three hundred pence and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and had the bag, and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, Let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always ye have with you. But me, ye have not always. Like I said, this is one of the first times Judas opens his mouth and talks. I appreciate what G. Campbell Morgan said. He, he said that when Judas begins to speak, his very words actually betray his own heart. As he talks, we find out who he really is. And it also teaches us that his betrayal... This isn't the one and only deed that Judas did wrong. What it indicates here in this passage is that long before he was a betrayer of Christ, he was a liar and a thief. And then he was a betrayer. As you and I look at this text, I think we see something about Judas that's really important to acknowledge. You see, he, like so many other disciples, he attached himself to Christ with really the hopes of what Christ would give to him. Many of the disciples, they wrestled and, 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 and really struggled to understand when the Lord talked about establishing a kingdom. Was it an earthly kingdom or a heavenly kingdom? And those disciples, of which Judas was one, wrestled with the idea that there was a, a real political power to Jesus, that he would set up an earthly reign. And like so many disciples who would wrestle with where they were going to be positioned in that earthly kingdom, I really believe that Judas, he attached himself to Christ. He hooked his wagon up to Christ with the hope that he would get some things. And one of the things we see here is that he's not getting what he thought he would get. There's not a prosperity that is coming to him to be identified with Jesus Christ. And in that unmet expectation, there's a frustration growing. And he's watching where money and where sacrifices are given. And it bothers him that he's not watching the coffers of Christ grow. He, he's seen great sacrifice be made and it doesn't make sense to him. Now, lest we just focus on Judas, don't miss the great contrast of this text. The great contrast here is that you see Mary 
selflessly sacrificing for the Lord with no expectation of return. And we have Judas that is wanting with no willingness to give. And that's the great contrast here, highlighting in the context of Mary's sacrifice just how self-centered Judas really is. So it's at this point that we, we kind of walk away from the text going, money means a lot to Judas. And that lays the platform for our next text, which is found in Matthew 26. So go back to Matthew 26, find verse 14, and let's just kind of ride uh, the, the wave of his love and attachment to money. And it makes sense why we see in verse 14, Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priests and said unto them, What will you give me, and I will deliver him unto you? And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Where it says that they covenanted with him. There, there was an agreement between the chief priests and Judas. A handshake was given per se. And, and there was an agreement that said, For thirty pieces of silver, Judas will turn over Christ to them. I looked up that phrase, thirty pieces of silver, and I, I can't say this. Um, 100%, but in, in some of my study, it, it really seemed to indicate that the equivalent price of this in today's economy would be about $30. We're not talking about a large amount of money. Some scholars, some commentators on that phrase, 30 pieces of silver, say that that 30 pieces of silver would have purchased the cheapest slave on the market. And and I think there's some pretty sobering things that we walk away from in that regard. One is that selfish, greedy people, they'll settle for anything no matter how small amount it is. For 30 pieces of silver, Judas is willing to betray Christ. It's what greed does. Secondly, the sobering thing is to recognize that these chief priests did not value Judas very highly. I mean, their, their exchange, their agreement is really over some coinage. And then thirdly, and I think it's the most sobering and it's the saddest thing that the 30 pieces of silver teach us, is that the chief priests, they didn't value Christ any more than 30 pieces of silver. What a tragedy. And yet he was willing to betray Christ for that. Now, let's continue the story. You're in Matthew 26. Look now at verse 47. Let, let's see how it all comes together. And while he yet spake, lo, Judas, one of the twelve, came, and with him a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same as he, hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus, and they took him. That little phrase, great multitude, I think there's a number we can put to that. It's roughly two to three hundred people. So it was necessary for Judas to have some type of visible sign to identify the one they were targeting because of the amount of people. And what he said was, I will target Jesus and identify him with a singular kiss. Now, when he comes to the Lord, he says, Hail, Master. And the word for kissed now seems to indicate that he kissed him more than once. And, and I say all that to say there was a flamboyance to the hypocrisy of Judas here. That, that Judas comes in and he has glowing words, Hail, Master, kiss, kiss. And there is a sadness in his flamboyant hypocrisy. But just as we saw contrast before in this message, look at the contrast now. Because look how Christ responds to this kind of hypocrisy. Verse 50, Jesus said unto him, Friend, Wherefore art thou come? Underscore the word friend. And I want you to take note of this, that Jesus, in all of his interactions with Judas, 
is kind, gracious, and affectionate, even though he knows that he would be the betrayer. What a wonderful challenge that Christ sets for us in his example of just kindness and affection for people who do us wrong. I, I think I'd be negligent if I didn't point something out. Now, Judas comes in, he betrays the Lord, and they grab hold of the Lord. Peter reaches into his sheath and pulls out his sword, and, and with great uh, erratic behavior, he, he slices off the ear of one of the soldiers. And the Lord tells him, he says, put that sword away. And it's at this point that we're beginning to comprehend something that I think is really, really important for us right now and in the days ahead. And that is to understand that from the very beginning of Christianity, Christ has designed Christianity not to be advanced with violence. Now, if you and I were to put a whole um, selection of world religions upon the table, we would see many of them, and some of the largest religions of the world, believe that their religion is advanced with violence. Christianity has never been designed that way, and from its inception is not designed that way. In fact, it's quite the opposite. Christ sets the example that the advancement of Christianity comes with the laying down of His life. And in the book of Acts, as these apostles grasp hold of the Lord's example, they begin to lay down their life repeatedly. And it's in that laying down of the life that the Christianity advances. And no matter what happens in the days ahead, our answer is not violence. Our answer is laying down our lives. Now, with that said, is Judas's betrayal unique? And I don't think it is. It's not unique. In fact, it's something fairly common. At its core, Judas betrayed Christ by taking something and valuing it more than Christ. And sometimes you and I, maybe for something different than 30 pieces of silver, we, in a sense, we betray Christ because we value our own name, our own comforts, our own prosperity. We value all kinds of things greater than Christ, and in so doing, we, we really look a lot like Judas. I've often thought there would be great wisdom in our responding to a message about betrayal the same way that the disciples did when the Lord said, one of you is going to betray me. There was a litany of questions. Lord, is it I? And the next one said, Lord, is it I? I really think when we think about betraying Christ, we, we not kind of set it aside and say, well, Judas is the only guy that ever did that. I would never do that. No, there's really good value in saying, Lord, is it I? And asking ourselves, is there anything in which we have elevated something over the value of Christ. Now, let's bring all this to a close and, and let's think about how Judas's life ends. He has betrayed Christ and he now has a problem. He realizes he betrayed an innocent man and he is just riddled with grief and guilt. He didn't know what to do with it. And one of the things that Judas teaches us is that when a man is very earthly-minded, he will try to solve his problems in earthly ways. And earthly-minded Judas has a problem of guilt, and he tries to solve it in some earthly ways. For instance, Matthew 27. Go with me to Matthew 27 and notice with me verse 3. Matthew 27 and verse 3. Then Judas, which had betrayed him when he saw that he was condemned, repented himself and brought again the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders, saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, What is that to us? See thou to that. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. 
And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful for to put them into the treasury, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. So you actually see two responses from Judas in which he's trying to deal with the guilt. The first one is he comes, he takes 30 pieces of silver and throws it back at them. He says, I don't want anything to do with it. But that doesn't solve his guilt. And so he goes to the more severe second level, and that is to take his own life. He goes to drastic measures to deal with the guilt of his soul. And in Acts 1, 17 through 19, you see the horrific detail of the suicide that he attempts to hang himself and perhaps the branch breaks or the rope breaks and he falls and he hits the jagged rocks below and his insides come outside and there's just a bloody mess. And one of the things that I think the Bible does in that very detailed account of his suicide is to remind us that sin always has an ugly end. And when it comes to the sin in our own lives, perhaps the realization that we have betrayed Christ and elevated something over Him, the Bible would command us and suggest and encourage us to deal with that guilt in the right way. Now, when some people think of Judas, they think of the betrayer's kiss. I want you to take that idea of the kiss and let's just kind of push it out of our mind. I want to bring a new kiss into our mind. It's the kiss of a father whose son rebelled against him, ran away, took his inheritance, and he spends it all and finds himself eating with the pigs. The Bible says that that son comes to the end of himself and he nervously, hesitantly, he kind of starts inching his way back to his father. And when he sees his father and his father sees him, the father eagerly comes running. And the father embraces him and then kisses him, welcoming the son back. I don't know where you're at. I, I don't know what kind of guilt is sitting in your life. You may have a lot of sorrow, like Judas did, but sorrow is not the same as repentance. It's, it, it, it doesn't make us right with God. But here's what I do know. We have a heavenly Father that is a master at dealing with our guilt, sin, and shame. And when we try to deal with our guilt in any other way than coming to Christ, it's just not going to work. And, and what it's going to do is cause us to try to find another method and a more severe method to deal with that sorrow and grief. And we may never get to the point that Judas did. But why would we go anywhere else if we have a Heavenly Father who wants to welcome us and deal with our guilt, shame, and sin? And so there is a lesson in the bad example of Judas, and that is, let's deal with our sin and shame the right way. As we close, I, I want to give you two thoughts to consider and two truths that comfort. In the thoughts that consider, I, I think number one, it is helpful for us to remember that it is possible to fool people some of the time. But God knows who we are all of the time. Let's just live honest lives. Let's avoid hypocrisy. Let, let's not let living so that people approve of us be the standard we're living for. Let's live honest lives because God knows who we are all of the time. Number two, the soil of unmet expectations has the ability to grow some of the worst sins. I referenced it earlier on that, that Judas had all these unmet expectations and they flow into creating this frustration 
that he didn't get from Christ what he had attached himself to Christ for. And there's a lesson in that, that if we're not careful with the unmet expectations of our life, they, they turn into a frustration, and that frustration turns into just a deep-seated bitterness. And it's in that bitterness that some of the worst things grow, like betraying Christ. Let's just deal with bitterness very, very seriously. In fact, let's take seriously any times we interact with unmet expectations. When the frustrations of not getting what we thought we would get happen, let's take it seriously because it's in that soil some of the worst things grow. Now, two truths to comfort. This is, this is really the exclamation mark. This is the dessert at the end of the message. Number one, would you remind yourself that one wicked man doing wicked things cannot thwart the plans of God? I mean, God had Christ come to earth to live a righteous life, to die on a cross, to be buried, to rise again, and Judas isn't going to mess that up. One of the things that I think is important for us to remember is that you and I should just never hang all of our hope on one person. And at the same time, we should never hang all of our despair on a person. There is no human being, okay? There's no politician, there is no leader, there's no celebrity, sports star, there's no pastor that is big enough to carry all of the hope of man. So let's not hang our hope on a man. At the same time, let's not hang all of our despair on a man. There are times in which the leaders around us fall the leaders around us or that God gives us, they are not godly people. But I don't have to crumble into despair because I don't hang all of my despair on people. One wicked man doing wicked things can't thwart the plan of God. And so we find great comfort in that. Secondly, I really find just a real, real truth that comforts is that God is immensely patient with people that we would quickly dismiss. I referenced it earlier. In every interaction with Judas, Christ is kind and gracious and affectionate. He, he lets him be one of the twelve. He gives to him ministry responsibility. He is patient with people that you and I would quickly dismiss. And the same God who was patient with Judas is patient with you and patient with me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the life of Judas. I thank you that you give us a bad example to teach us good truths. Help us to walk away from his life considering our own life. Help us to also walk away from his life considering our great God. Lord, we love you and we thank you for being you. In your name we pray. Amen.